Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, come into his courts with praise, give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good and his steadfast love endures forever. His faithfulness lasts to all generations. Let's pray. Father, it is because you are a good and gracious and loving and powerful father that we come before you today. Fill our hearts with joy as we gather before you that in our homes we can know that we're in your courts, uh, that we are before your presence. We thank you for that. We thank you for your steadfast love and faithfulness. We pray that you would strengthen to live as people who are devoted to you all this coming week. Oh, Lord Jesus, we ask this in your most holy and beautiful name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us for the online ministry of the Wyndham Center Church. We're happy to be able to be with you as you are able to come and participate. If you are around in person in these days, uh, next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent, December 1st. And we always participate in the big tree lighting on the green outside of our building. We participate with the fire department and it's a nice community event that we get to help and lead the singing. Um, so if you're able to come, it starts at six o'clock. If you're planning to come and join the choir, uh, be here about quarter till and we'll be ready. Uh, but that's a, it's, it's a fun way to kick off our celebration of the coming of Christ. December 1st is the first Sunday of Advent, and I still have copies of this little booklet. It's called Everyday Gospel. It's written by Paul Tripp, who is he's a great teacher and puts things in very, very clear, understanding ways. The de devotional actually starts. The first reading is next Sunday. And so if you would like a copy, just let me know. We'll get one off to you. Uh, better yet, if you are able, come out and uh, pick, your, pick up one yourself, either uh, in the week or uh, next Sunday, joining us for worship. Today, uh, the church calendar for this particular time is uh, Christ the King Sunday. It is the final Sunday of the Christian year. And uh, just a brief intro to Christ the King. I hadn't realized this, but Christ the King Sunday was designated at the end of uh, well, at the end of World War One, after the end of what was called the War to End All Wars, which we know wasn't. And people wanted to remind us as Christians that no human emperor, no human king, no prime minister—they don't last forever. And then the kingdoms of the earth rise and fall. But Christ, our King, is forever and ever. And it gave an anchoring point uh, in the midst of all of that turmoil. And so we honor today, we recognize today as Christ the King Sunday, uh, next week being Advent and preparing in our hearts for his, not only his return, but thinking back to his birth again. And so there's a, a few themes of his reign and his, uh, his wonder. I read from Psalm 100 in our opening the first passage I'd like to read for us to hear is uh, from Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 through 10 and 13 and 14. Daniel has had a vision. It's the first year of Belshazzar. As I looked, thrones were placed and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow. The hair of his head like pure wool, his throne was fiery flames, its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him, and a thousand thousands served him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. He came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, 
and his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. From John 14, as Jesus is teaching and getting ready to uh, return home. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. It is enough for us. Jesus said, have I been with you so long that you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he also do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. May God strengthen and encourage us in the reading and the hearing of his holy word. Let's pray. Father, the Sunday before Thanksgiving is a day that we acknowledge a special way, Christ our King, Christ our eternal King, whose reign is forever and ever. The great songs of Handel's Messiah, the hymns that we sing, the scriptures, they remind us that we belong to an eternal and unshakable kingdom. And in this uh, shaking, tumultuous world, it's a blessing to our hearts to know that we belong to that which will outlast this world. Our bodies will one day come to an end, but that will just release us to our eternal life with you. And uh, we want to thank you for that today. We're also thinking this week about Thanksgiving and a uh, time that we will have with family or friends. And while this shouldn't be the only time that we give thanks, it is often a time that we focus on it more. Lord, help us to note those things for which we are especially thankful. Thank you, Lord, for making us. Thank you, Lord, for uh, families. Thank you for life. Thank you for skills. Thank you for opportunities to serve and be served, to love and be loved. Thank you for your provision and your protection. Thank you for ways that you have answered prayers. Thank you for how you comfort us in loss. Thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus. As we close our eyes in death, we open them to glory and, uh, and our eternal life with you. We thank you, Lord, for that. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity as we give to uh, help other people come to know you. And, and in church, we're giving to the ministry of Sat7, the satellite television ministry across North Africa and all the way over to uh, Pakistan. A very, very wide territory, Lord, where the gospel is going forth and people are coming to know Jesus. We rejoice in that and that we can have a small part in that. Lord, help us not just to give so that people elsewhere can have life in Jesus. Help us to keep our eyes open and our responses ready. Because there are people in our lives, people in our families and our neighborhoods that need to know you. And so even as we send money around the world, help us, Lord, to be present with those here who need to know you as well. Strengthen us that we might be able to respond to questions with grace and respect and uh, be able to use us to persuade, Father. Use us to persuade the goodness and the glory of Christ and his death on the cross for us. Father, even as we're thinking today, many people whom we know, in fact, maybe some who are participating now, just live in great pain and sorrows. Um, we ask for your mercy to be richly outpoured, and perhaps our hands will help to do that. 
But would you just hear us now uh, as we lift up people whom we love and care for, for your work and your ministry in and to them. Hear us, we ask now. O oh Lord, for all these things, we offer you our thanks in the matchless name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. There are two verses that I would like to read as we get started this morning. The first is uh, Romans 12, chapter 1, and the second is 1 Peter 4, verse 10. Romans 12, 1. Paul writes, I appeal to you, therefore, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Peter wrote, 1 Peter 4, as each one has received a gift, use it to serve one another as stewards of God's varied graces. God strengthen us. God, God, strengthen us as we uh, as we continue. Um, so today, you can see behind me some Christmas boxes, and uh, this afternoon they're going to be beginning their journey around the world. They're going to a distribution center, and then they'll be going to the country where children will gather in rooms, and uh, they will get their box. And people will be talking about the box and where they've come from and what they're about. And at just the right time, they'll get everybody together and they'll start counting back. Three, two, one, open your boxes. And utter pandemonium breaks loose as the children just laugh and giggle and are so excited to see what all is uh, happening with their toys and with the things in the boxes. For many of these kids, it's the very first Christmas gift that they have ever received in their life. And it's often the first time that they come to hear about Jesus, who is the one who motivated sending these gifts. Um, and then as they have opportunity, they can participate in a discipleship program called Life's Greatest Adventure. And there is story upon story of uh, lives changed, of children who've come to know Christ, families who have been changed, even whole villages who have been changed because of the grace of God in this gift. Can you imagine what would happen if the gift came and they didn't open it? And they just took the gift home and they set it on their shelf and it just stayed there. Or, or if they opened it, and they didn't do anything with any of the contents. Again, it just sat there. Well, no, of course, that's not going to happen. You get a gift, it is received, it is welcomed, it is taken in. It is from Jesus to them, and they, they rejoice and they share. And there is just a lot of yelling and shouting and singing. And it's a wonderful picture when you get to watch the video reports of those. The gifts that Jesus has sent. Thankfully, using our own hands, using our own resources, the gifts that Jesus has sent are meant to be enjoyed. They are meant to be played with and read and kicked and used and produce joy and happiness in the lives of everybody involved. This morning, we build on our theme of growing in the grace of giving. And we're thinking about how you and I receive and use the gifts that the Lord has given to us. We're building on a theme that we began a couple weeks ago, that God so loved that he gave. And in this creation and in our lives and ultimately in salvation, God's loving and giving is the reason that this whole universe exists. And then we respond out of the joy of receiving what he's given to us, we considered individuals whose lives were utterly transformed as, as the light went off in their brain, in their mind, in their heart, and they really responded to what Jesus was doing for them. And there was this organic explosion of life in them as they dedicated themselves and the things that God had given them back to him. This morning, I want to take one step further as we give ourselves back to the Lord in very practical ways. And the two verses from uh, Romans 12 and from 1 Peter chapter 4 
bringing together help us to, to grasp in a very practical way how we grow in the grace of giving as we understand more what it was that God has given to us. I begin with uh, Romans 12. And as Paul begins that verse, I therefore Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, he's writing to believers. And, and that's important when you understand what he's exhorting them to do. Brothers and sisters, everybody that he's writing to has already received in their lives the gift of salvation. Now, just quickly, what is the gift of salvation? Salvation is rescue. Salvation is release from the punishment that we have deserved because we have gone off on our own way and we've turned, we've rejected God and his gifts. We have become the king and the Lord of our own lives and that bears consequences. Salvation is rescue from those consequences. It is it's forgiveness for the sin that we have committed because Jesus dealt with it fully on the cross when he died and was raised. Beyond forgiveness, it's a cleansing of guilt and a cleansing of our heart, a cleansing of us inside, making us vessels that was fit for God to use. And those vessels receive his Holy Spirit to come in. And a new life is created in us. The, the Bible uses words like being born again or born from above as the Holy Spirit enters our hearts and our lives. He marks us with his, as, with his name. He seals us his own. And so we have an eternity, an uh, eternity to look forward to with him. We have a home that is being made ready. We belong to him. That really, that sums up the salvation that is received when we put our trust in Christ. That's not what he's talking about here. As people who have yielded the throne of our lives to Christ, there's ongoing activity that he wants for us to engage in. Therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, present your bodies to God as living sacrifices. Present your bodies to God as living sacrifices. Do so with all that God has done for you in mind, that, that he has forgiven you, he has cleansed you, he has accepted you. It is that God gave first. God gave first. And for you and me as Christians, the work of faith is our response of offering ourselves back, offering ourselves back to the Lord as what Paul calls living sacrifices. The Old Testament was full of sacrifices. They weren't living, though. Uh, they were bodies that were offered to God at the temple. Um, they were offered in a specific manner. They were slain, and their blood was poured out. It had really to do with the life totally given over to the Lord. And then often the bodies were burned, and the picture of the smoke ascending is a vis visualization of a spiritual reality of something being totally dedicated to the Lord where he is. Now, what we have to offer is something very, very valuable, but is not to be surrendered to smoke. It is not to be offered up like that. It is rather our own bodies yielded back to the Lord for use. When one of those animals was offered, it was gone. I mean, it was gone. When we offer ourselves, it's in how we live. And so we take something that is very, very valuable to us, that is ourselves, and we offer our lives in these physical bodies. And we offer that life in all the things that we do in our physical body while we live in it. It's my body is where Jesus lives by the Holy Spirit. And it is Jesus who then is at work in me. From the passage in John 14, where um, Jesus talks about us having work to do and things that we can do, he's doing that work, you know, in us. And so this is the body that we allow Jesus to rule in and, and work in in us. It is, in verse 2, it is a body that acts directed by a mind that is renewed by God's word so that we live according to God's holy will. We, we stop sinning with our bodies, so there's stuff that we stop doing, and then we start, and we start yielding ourselves as we say, Lord, I offer my life to you. 
1 Corinthians 6, 15, Paul says this, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body. Glorify God with your body. That's where we live. It isn't who we are, but it's our dwelling place. We can't really completely be separated from it because when we get to heaven, we're going to get a brand new one back. We are meant to be physical and spiritual, but we are, we are not our body, but that body is the place that, that we live. Well, there are many different ways in Scripture that we can think about offering ourselves back to the Lord, but the one I want to focus on today focuses uh, thinking about the gifts that he has given us in life. 1 Peter 4, 2, um, a little bit before the verse that I read earlier ago, it's basically because of what Jesus has done for you, Peter's beginning, which is similar to Paul saying, by the mercies of God. Peter goes on to say, live for the will of God, which is Paul's version of, which is his version of Paul's words, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, because that's where you live. Well, how do we do that? How do we think about that? In verse 10, Peter says, each of you has received a gift. It is something that Jesus has planned for you, that the Holy Spirit has given to you. Some people receive one. I think most people receive several. Some receive very many. And the Holy Spirit, looking at your life and planning your Christian life, has wrapped up gifts for you from Jesus. And he's given them to you and me, not to sit on a shelf, not to be ignored, but to use. Every December, I like to reread The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, the first story in C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia. And in this story, there's a Father Christmas character, and he comes and he gives people gifts. And, and as you read through the story, those gifts come into very important play uh, in terms of the character and which, which person received which gifts. And, and each gift was given for a purpose. Each gift was expected to be used in the manner that Aslan, who is the Jesus figure in this story, the lion Aslan, has for them. They were given by Father Christmas. They came from Aslan. Aslan gave them because in coming situations, they had purpose. When Jesus gives you and me a gift, it comes from his heart to us because of what he desires for us to do to be able to serve him. Every follower of Christ has a gift. If you are a follower of Christ, you have at least one gift that the Lord has given to you. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, the Holy Spirit has apportioned them out as he has determined in the body of Christ. The local church is the place where these gifts are expressed and experienced, not just for work within the congregation. It certainly spreads out beyond that, but that is the context. Peter goes on to say each one determines his or her gift and to use it uh, to serve one another in the body of Christ. We are to serve one another in the body of Christ. And, and he sums it up in two words, serving and speaking, serving and speaking. We serve in God's strength and we speak with God's enabling. We, we spoke about this a number of weeks ago and we listed a number of the kinds of things that this all involves. But with the goal is so that when we do that, we're glorifying God in Christ. When you and I use the gifts that the Lord has given to us, that brings glory to Jesus because it, it reflects on what he's done. He's transformed us from thinking about ourselves and our lives devoted to him. In Ephesians 4, uh, he talks about gifts that build up the body of Christ. He talks about apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. All of these gifts build up the body of Christ toward maturity so that we can be built together, built together in him. And the body grows. And when each member of the body is fulfilling and using the gift that he or she has received, when you do that, you grow and others grow and we all grow together. We all grow together. 
we have enjoyed having our littlest granddaughter with us this week, little Leia. And uh, it's been so fun to see how she's grown even over just a few days that we have been together. She has the most beautiful little body, the beautiful face with eyes and smile. And every part of her body is growing. Every piece is contributing its part to the wellness of the body. And when that happens, there is health. And as that health happens, there's happiness and there's expansion. And she becomes more and more the wonderful little person that she is growing into being. This is a physical picture of what God desires to, for you and me when he plants us in the body of Christ as believers. If we go back to Romans chapter 12, where we began earlier, Paul talks in verse 4 about in this body, there are many parts. There are many different members, parts together. They're all different, but God brings them together in one body and all function together for the benefit of the whole. It's a good break from American individualism. If there's an American idol, it is definitely our individualism in the sense that we don't need other people. There are other nations that are much more of a commonwealth in terms of how they understand life, and they view themselves as having an accountability to one another, a responsibility to one another in terms of how we relate and how we care. And it's not to say that doesn't exist here, but it's Sometimes it can be a real challenge getting people over our individualism. Well, he goes off in verse 6. He lists a number of them. I'm just going to name them. Prophecy, service, teaching, exhorting, giving, leading, acts of mercy. And uh, each one of those has different nuances, you know, underneath. Um, there, there are more than here. This is not an exhaustive list. So as you look elsewhere in Scripture, there's administration. Um, there are quiet private kind of gifts. There are very public gifts. There are broad caregiving gifts. And you have one. You probably have more than one. And Jesus wrapped it up and he gave it to you because he has a specific spot for you to play in the body of Christ. And if you're not doing it, the body of Christ is not getting what it needs. You know, all of us, as we age, different parts of our body stop working as well. And, and that affects us, you know, maybe our elbow doesn't bend as well, or maybe our ear doesn't hear as well. We have all manner of things where parts just stop working. Well, think of yourself as you are a part of an entity, a living organism, not just an organization, but an, an organism. And when people refuse to do what God has given them to do, they suffer, and the whole suffers as well. Dare I say that if we do not do what the Lord has given us to do, if we don't pick up the box, if we don't even open it to look in it, if we look in it and then close it and put it on a shelf, if we just don't pay any attention to it at all, no matter what we might say, that is very ungrateful. It is very ungrateful if we neglect what God has given to us. It's not trusting him. It's not realizing that he has a purpose. And it is in our employ of the gift that the Lord has given to us that we really express our gratitude for all that he has done. Well, how do you determine what your gift is? Uh, you look at all those lists and there's others. How do you determine? Well, there's no, there's no magic formula to determine what your gift is. There are different kinds of tools that people have developed over the years. They're questionnaires and you read through them and at the end you get several ideas of what your gifts might be that you might try. I think it could be a, a simpler approach than that. A spiritual gift can take the form of anything that you are already good at, devoted to the Lord, and that he uses to bring grace and a result. It isn't necessarily something that you're already good at. It may be something that he's desiring for you to grow in, or it may be something that he actually builds in you as a strength that you didn't think was a strength before. So as you think about how you discover what it is God has for you, begin to ask the question, well, so what am I good at? What are my skills? What is it that I love to do to be able to bless other people? Chances are good that that's an area you should explore and get involved in as a spiritual gift. 
what gets your attention? When you look at an organization, when you look at relationships, when you look at situations, is there something that you notice and you think about and you start to say, you know, this could be better or I think I could really be of help here? What is your heart burden for? What area of ministry is your heart burden for? Do you care about people over in the nursing home and you, you really have a burden for sharing Jesus' love with them in their particular place in life? Or you think of a particular issue that children face or other people face. What, what is your heart burdened for that you could be involved in helping? What needs to be done that nobody else is doing, but somebody could help with. Spiritual gifting can be revealed in just what you see, and it isn't, it, it isn't some secret formula that God tries to hide, and you can begin and learn what your gifts are just by what you're doing. It's, it's good to be able to try things. It's good to be able to be available. And the things that God has really given to you may emerge while you are in the midst of that. The story that I discovered a few years ago is about a, a little boy named Hugo Cabret. And I think he's about 10 or 11. And he lives in a train station in Paris and he winds the clocks. There's a long backstory to that that you don't really need to know. But as he's going around from clock to clock, you know, winding it over the day, there's a girl that finds out that he's there. and He's not really supposed to be in there doing that. So it's kind of secret that he's doing it. But she finds him and, he, and but she's sad and she doesn't really feel like she has a purpose in life. And after all his years working in the clocks and seeing it, he said, you know what I've learned? I said, as I work on all these clocks, I've never seen any extra parts. There are no extra parts. Every part, no matter how small, no matter how large, has a place. It has something that it needs to do. And if it's not missing, not everything's going to be right. And, and he, he says, and I think that if clocks are like that, I think it's like that with us too. There's no unimportant people. We all have a part to play. We just need to work to find. What a wonderful picture to think about it. There, not one of you is insignificant in God's book. You may not be able to do the things that you used to be able to do. But if you seek and if you ask the Lord, Lord, how can I be useful? You said you gave me a gift. What is that gift now that I'm in this particular place and stage of life? How can I be useful to you even now today? Inaction is ungrateful. We might not feel ungrateful, but doesn't matter what we feel. It's the action. It's the attitude. Jesus gave his life for you so that he would be able to give you these gifts. What more could he give? There's a song we sing that. He gave his life. What more could he give? to give you a place, to give you a way that you can make a difference. He gave his life to transform you and me from self-directed living and thinking to being his servants and to be vessels of his life, vessels of his joy, vessels of his mercy, vessels of his goodness toward other people. That's how much. And, and he said in John 14, even greater things than I have done, you're going to do because I'm sending you my spirit into your life. There's a pastor, uh, Andrew Davis. Um, he's a North Carolina pastor, but he grew up in New England near Sudbury, Massachusetts. He talks about visiting a grist mill there, and uh, it was by the river, and the water goes in from the river, and it turns a wheel, and all of the parts work together so that the, the millstone is turned, and grain is ground, and flour um, happens. And, and he thinks about that in terms of this concept of spiritual gifts. He writes this, each of us has spiritual gifts given to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his wise plan, the body of Christ builds itself up in love as each part does its work. But the church only functions as we all put our time in in serving the Lord in this manner. Time, 
ministry time, hours of labor with one another, alongside one another, toward one another, within the congregational fellowship, is the most precious resource he writes for the growth and the maturing of the body of Christ. He says, as more and more of God's people give of their time, it's like the river running at flood stage and making those wheels turn and those gears turn and the millstone turns and it just produces a massive amount of flour because everything is operating at its full. I think a good picture of our understanding of spiritual gifts. Well, as I think of him, I think of a personal example. Over this last week, uh, over these last couple of weeks, one of our dear, dear uh, sisters went home to be with the Lord. Her name is Dee. And as I had the privilege of getting to know Dee over the years, Dee viewed her life as something for the Lord to use. Her life was yielded to him. And, and her life bore fruit in so many different ways before she ever came here to church. But then when she did come here to church, her life just exploded in service and usefulness and blessing, whether it was in Sunday school with children, whether it was serving on our deacon board, whether it was her card ministry for birthdays and anniversaries or part of the quilting group or the teas or so many different ways. And on top of that, tremendously generous. If it wasn't something that she could do, she could fund it to help somebody else to do it. Dee's gift at the core was to see things that could be done. She would look at things and think about what could happen to enhance people's lives, to enhance our ministry, and then she would invest her life to make that happen. It was really the, the question or the, the declaration of the Lord, here I am, Lord, use me, I'm available to you, I'm showing up. And her life was a constant illustration of offering one's body to the Lord as a living sacrifice. I have another quote from uh, Andrew Davis. He talks about the, the idea of so much that there is to do, and um, it is a sacrifice. Time is so much of a sacrifice these days because we seem to have so little of it, and we have so much that we want to be able to do. He uh, Davis highlights a principle that perhaps you've heard of before. It's the 80-20 principle, or I, I think now it's more like the 90-10 principle. There are so many tasks to be done in church that anyone can do that don't require any special gift at all. Most churches respond by squeezing 20% of the active, hardworking people for even more sacrifices. It's ineffective for the long run, and it means the other 80% will have little to show their Lord for their lives when the time comes for showing. Offer yourself to Christ. Give him your whole self. Ask, Lord, am I doing all that I can to serve your people, to use what you have given me to bless the body of Christ? Am I dedicated to you? I believe you want to do great things, Lord, but I know you expect to use me and others to do it. That's a good perspective. That's a good perspective. 20 years ago, we began a study in Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Life, and had five purposes called from the teaching of the scripture about what God made us for. And one of those purposes was that we are shaped to serve. Every Christian is shaped to serve. And we're all different. Just like physically, we're all different shapes. Spiritually, in our lives, we have all different shapes. Warren says this, you were put on earth to make a contribution. God designed you to make a difference in your life. You were created to add life on earth, and he wants you to give something back. You were created to serve God. Well, we have a document that has many different options, and certainly not all that one could be done. And, and this is not designed to be a, a recruiting Sunday per se, but it is an opportunity for us to, to review lives and saying, okay, if, if God so loved that he gave, 
is it, it realistic to think that he wants to create in me that I so love the body of Christ that Jesus died for? that God has things for me to do to bless them in Jesus' name. I would love to help you discern what that could be. I'd love to help you discern what that could be. Email me, give me a call. Um, that would be something that I would love to talk with you. Well, as we think about God's love for us, we think about God's great love, let's love him back. Let's love him joyfully opening up the gifts that he's given. Let's open, let's love him sharing with others the gifts that he's given, being a blessing. Um, and that will, that will so give glory to God. It will so encourage other people. It will cause people who don't know Jesus yet to, to be curious and wonder and want to know more about this Jesus whom you serve. It's a win-win-win situation as you and I commit ourselves to that. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the gift of salvation. And thank you that you entrust work to us. We can all think of people who they have to do it themselves because they don't trust anybody else to do it the right way. But that's not, way, that's not the way you worked with your disciples. You sent your disciples out knowing that they would stumble and make mistakes. So it was a part of their growth. And you send us out. And we sure stumble, make mistakes. We don't always have the right attitude. But you trust us enough because you would accomplish more in and through us. And that you would say, like, Father, when you came up out of the baptism water, this is my son. I'm pleased. I'm proud. And like the, the master of the servants who are faithful, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. You've been faithful with a little. I'm going to multiply that. Lord, would you work that in us today? Would you work that in us today and turn us loose as active, vibrant servants and see the life that explodes. Strengthen us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us today. If you haven't already listened to the songs on the playlist, I encourage you to do so. They run the gamut from Christ Our King songs to serving songs to worship songs and just really celebrating the goodness of God. And so just uh, God bless you today. And uh, as I will not likely see most of you before Thanksgiving, I hope that your Thanksgiving is a very rich time for you, whether you're home alone or whether you have the privilege of being with loved ones. God bless you.